thank you very much, Philip, and thank you all for being here this evening. It's great to see a full room. I apologize that uh, my accent is uh, much less cultured than Philip's. <laughs> I had no choice in where I was brought up, and uh, <laughs> I could sit and, and listen to Philip for hours and just, uh, just delight in uh, uh, impeccable English. I also have wonderful memories from 30 years ago that surround such things as uh, playing croquet on a perfectly manicured lawn um, that uh, is kept shorter than anything that could ever grow in Denver. Uh, we're a semi-arid uh, location and uh, so I'm reminding myself once again these past couple of days that there are parts of the world with humidity. <laughs> <laughs> And there are advantages and disadvantages to each. <laughs> I think this is uh, uh, a daunting challenge that I've been given. Uh, I have some idea of what uh, a public lecture is supposed to be. I have some idea of how to teach a class of master's level students. I have some idea of what to do in, in church, in preaching, in Sunday school. Um, but I'm not quite sure what to do in a combination of this kind. Um, it's supposed to be the beginning of a class that most of you will not take. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm glad to hear that there is still time for uh, for more to join us uh, again on Thursday night. Uh, one of the books you'll see in the back that uh, is not mine, and so I can recommend it, uh, is uh, Janine Brown's uh, commentary on Matthew in the Teaching the Text series. It is extremely accessible uh, to the layperson. Uh, um, but it is theologically uh, profound. It's not dumbed down in any sense. And uh, it's the first time I've experimented with using it as a textbook, um, but it seemed to me to be perfectly suited for what you are trying to do here at BGST. Uh, it's still quite new, uh, just been out a couple of years, and, uh, and I think you will like it. I was asked tonight to reflect on Matthew in the 1st and 21st centuries. I will probably err on the side of the former, but we will uh, certainly get to the latter and um, have a good time for question and answer uh, discussion uh, after what I trust will be no more than an, an hour uh, starting at this moment. I don't know what uh, you first think of when you hear the Gospel of Matthew. There are many Christians who know quite a lot about the details of Jesus' life. They perhaps have studied the Gospels repeatedly throughout their adult lives. But if you ask them what makes Matthew distinct from Mark and each of those different from Luke and the three of them different again from the Gospel of John that might be a harder question to address. If it does not seem odd to us that we have four Gospels we've probably been in church all our lives. <laughs> There's no other part of scripture that is repeated <laughs> that many times. But then on the other hand, the four Gospels are not identical and the church early on resisted the temptation to canonize a harmony of the Gospels. It kept each of the four, presumably written for distinctive purposes, initially to distinctive audiences, under varying circumstances. So what do you think of when uh, 
You think the Gospel of Matthew does a structure, does a sequence of topics, does an outline of any kind come to your mind? Those of you who uh, are more mathematical or uh, inclined to uh, graphs rather than narrative prose maybe can uh, relate more than others to uh, this line graph that I have created. Oh. That works too. Thank you. Now we've got the whole screen. There are parts of Matthew that are quite similar to what one finds in Mark and Luke, but unlike Mark, there are two chapters at the beginning that are about the events surrounding the birth and uh, earliest years of Jesus' life. Luke also starts with two such chapters, but gives us largely different information about Jesus' earliest years. Matthew ends, unlike Mark, with a detailed chapter on the resurrection. So also does Luke, but with largely different events related to Jesus' resurrection appearances. The parts of the line that uh, are not bolded in any way are those sections that are largely duplicated in one or both of the other synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But there are five major blocks of sermonic material largely uh, uninterrupted and extended teaching on the part of Jesus around uh, coherent themes. The, the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 to 7 being by far the most famous of the five. And then in chapter 10 as he gets ready to send out the twelve to replicate his mission, Jesus gives a, a discourse on mission. Chapter 13 is almost entirely devoted to a selection of eight of his well-known parables. In chapter 18, Jesus is addressing the disciples by themselves, talking on themes of humility and forgiveness. And then in chapters 23 through 25, there is a series of woes against a selection of the Pharisees and scribes for their hypocrisy followed immediately by Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives about the end of the age, the destruction of the temple, Christ's return at some point after that. And there are short parallels from some of these bolded sections in the other Gospels, but not large stretches. For the most part, the material is unique to Matthew, and the organization of them into discrete topics is unique to Matthew. So what's he up to? There are a couple of key verses, and I hope some of you brought Bibles. Maybe there are some in the room someplace to share, I don't know. This is a church. <laughs> but I know that doesn't mean they're in every room. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, after a series of introductory chapters and topics, Matthew writes, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. From that time on, Jesus began to. Remember those words, and then flip, maybe on your phones, scroll to chapter 16, verse 21. 
after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah on the road to Caesarea Philippi, Matthew writes, From that time on, Jesus began to. The identical seven words in English, the identical words in the Greek. And this time, it's from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, dot, 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 that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Matthew seems to be giving two clues that he is dividing his book into an introductory part, a section about Jesus' primary public ministry, and a section that begins to follow him on the road to the cross and the events that will culminate in his death and resurrection. And that's been a, a commonly observed uh, way of dividing the gospel into three parts. How does that fit with the five blocks of sermons that we have here? Are they two separate approaches to understanding Matthew's structure that compete? I don't think so. The first four chapters in a bit fall discreetly into two chapters surrounding Jesus' infancy and early years properly. And then a jump directly to him as an adult as his ministry intersects with a man by the name of John who's called the baptizer. Followed by Jesus' departure into the wilderness and uh, temptation by the devil. He returns, he calls his first disciples, and then we read from that time on he began to preach that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, was near. The body does indeed start at this point, but after a brief introduction, we then have the three chapters that make up the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of those three chapters, the crowds marvel. Matthew 7.28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Which is a rather remarkable statement since their teachers of the law had quite a bit of authority. But from what we learn from later rabbinic writings, the Jewish teachers grounded their legal decisions, their narrative exhortations and injunctions, either in some previous respected rabbi or in scripture itself, what Christians call the Old Testament. Jesus never once quotes any previous rabbi and when he quotes the Old Testament, at least in the Sermon on the Mount, it's largely to disagree with the standard interpretation of a part of it. Who has the authority to speak like that? Seems appropriate to label these chapters Jesus' authority in preaching. Then come chapters 8 and 9, a collection of 10 miracle stories, most of them miracles of healing of one kind or another. Almost all found in either Mark or Luke or both, but only Matthew groups them together into two chapters consecutively in this fashion. And as we skim through them, we are amazed that uh, he stills the storm and the disciples ask what kind of man is this 827 that even the wind and the waves obey him he heals a 
paralyzed man, but also claims to be able to forgive his sins. And at the end of that story in 9.8, when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. It continues that way, and by the end of chapter 9, some of the people that were to turn into Jesus' most hardened opponents begin to accuse him of having diabolical authority and power. It's by the power of Satan that he casts out demons. It seems appropriate to think in terms of these chapters as dealing with Jesus' authority in healing. And at the end of chapter 9, Jesus goes through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Check the end of chapter 4, and you'll see words almost to the identical effect. There appears to be a, a frame, uh, bookends, uh, an inclusio, if you like technical rhetorical terms, around chapters 5 through 9 that put preaching and healing together. One uninterrupted section of sermon, of teaching, followed by a series of events that are narrated, and yet they share to some degree, a common topic. Is that a coincidence? No. I think it happens again. The first hint of opposition in the Gospel of Matthew comes in 934, when the Pharisees accuse Jesus of driving out demons by the prince of demons. Chapter 10 prepares the disciples for mission. We mentioned that. It's in yellow. It's one of the highlighted blocks of, of teaching. But after the opening verses, the majority of the chapter increasingly predicts the hostility that the disciples will experience. Not immediately. Not on this short journey while Jesus is alive, but as time goes on, after his death and resurrection. And then chapters 11 and 12 begin to give us glimpse of bits of that hostility starting to be experienced. So that by the end of chapter 11, Jesus is unleashing woes on unrepentant towns in Israel. He is coming into conflict with uh, Pharisaic understandings of Sabbath law in chapter 12. And the hint about driving out demons by the prince of demons becomes a repeated charge that leads to a, a full-blown conflict occupying the second half of chapter 12. Once again, it seems that uh, consecutive chapters are on related topics. What makes Matthew's chapter on parables stand out from the other Gospels? Halfway through, Jesus stops talking outside to the crowds and moves indoors and speaks solely to the disciples. No other Gospel frames the selection of Jesus' parables in quite that way. Jesus moves from teaching the crowds, and yet even while he is teaching the crowds, he says to them things like 13, 14, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving, predicting that many won't get it, they won't understand, and their hearts will be increasingly hardened. But to the disciples, who often don't understand at first, they at least ask, and they receive interpretation, and they stay with Jesus, and they're instructed further. There's an increasing polarization to Jesus in his ministry that's explained in the sermonic material, if you like, of the parables, 
and then enacted as Jesus quickly leaves Jewish territory for the one and only extended time in this Gospel's narrative and matches outside of Israel various things that he does inside of Israel. He feeds the 5,000. Primarily a Jewish crowd, he feeds the 4,000. Primarily a Gentile crowd. All leading to the culmination of asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter, for one short moment, getting it right. <laughs> You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But in short compass, Jesus predicts his passion and Peter is not prepared for that. He begins to rebuke his Lord and Jesus returns the favor. <laughs> and we begin with a series of teachings about discipleship on the road to Jerusalem. But in narrative fashion. The next uninterrupted bit, chapter 18, is still talking about discipleship exclusively to the Twelve on themes of humility and forgiveness that will loom large and be important if the disciples are to cope with his death and resurrection. As we approach the end, various parables traps set for Jesus by people who come asking him difficult questions all lead to increasing comment about the coming judgment on the Jewish leaders of the nation in the first century and then that is enacted in uh, what Jesus says directly in the woes of chapter 23 and the prediction of the destruction of the temple in chapter 24 but eventually all nations will be judged. Finally, there are lengthy treatments of Jesus' passion and death and of his resurrection in some way balancing out the opening introductory chapters. I think Matthew is very deliberately, very intricately um, crafted. I think the Spirit of God inspired him to put things together in a distinctive way for what the early church tells us was the most Jewish of all the Christian audiences to which the various Gospels were written. And in light of, as the first century went on, a growing tension between the church and synagogue. Scholars debate whether Matthew's Jewish Christian audience had just recently broken from the synagogue, uh, was in the process of doing so. Um, but tensions are perhaps high, and yet at the same time, hopes are high that more Jews will become Jesus followers will become uh, believers in Jesus of Nazareth as the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. How does Matthew come to put all of this together? For those of you who aren't coming back, we won't trouble you for too long with charts and diagrams about the most common solution to the so-called synoptic problem, the literary relationship of the first three Gospels. Mark probably written first, Matthew and Luke following and using in part uh, much of Mark. Another uh, collection of Jesus sayings, uh, often called Q, which simply comes from a German word quella, which means source. Nothing any more mysterious about that and has nothing to do with uh, James Bond movies or <laughs> British intelligence. And then possibly uh, sources unique to Matthew simply designated as M and unique to Luke designated as L. But there's also a recurring and intriguing tradition in several ancient Christian writers that Matthew first wrote something in the Hebrew language. 
the Christian writer Papias, very early in the second century, said that Matthew compiled the teachings of Jesus, the, the oracles, the Greek word is logia, in the Hebrew tongue, or possibly Aramaic, the word could mean either one. And everyone translated them as they were able. An intriguing reference. No ancient copy of Matthew in Hebrew has ever been found. Hasn't created some people from inventing one, what it might look like, and passing it off on the internet as though it had been found, but you don't believe everything you see on the internet. I know that. Only Americans are that gullible. <laughs> Matthew was perhaps the author of something short of less than the full-fledged gospel that we now have and perhaps used that along with the other documents that we have had maybe after Mark was written to add more narrative material and put it in the form we have. It's simply a hypothesis. Maybe this proto-Matthew, this previous edition of Matthew, actually was something like what scholars call Q. That has been suggested, but there's probably no way to prove it. What we do know is that Matthew in the earliest centuries was the most popular of the four Gospels. And I probably should have entitled this Matthew in the first century and a little bit later, as well as in the 21st century. Because we don't actually have other Christian documents from the first century to prove that Matthew was the most popular, but we have them from the second and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the handout that you have in front of you, um, which uh, is simply a collection of quotations, uh, all from the Ancient Christian Commentary series volume on Matthew, um, corresponds to a collection of passages that struck me as illustrative of Matthew's original popularity. The very opening verses that give the genealogy of Jesus. We read at the beginning, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then come uh, about 42 names. Several of them mothers who typically did not appear in ancient Jewish genealogies. And all of them women under whom some suspicion, rightly or wrongly, of illegitimate sexual activity was predicated. For those of you who dare to come back, we'll say more about that Thursday night. Luke also has a genealogy, but parts of it are quite different, and that fascinated the earliest Christian commentators and writers. And one of the ways they dealt with it was to focus on Matthew being the gospel for the Jews. Chromatius, I've given very ballpark dates uh, for some of these citations, said, Thus Matthew rightly counted Christ our Lord as the descendant of, Abraham, uh, of David and Abraham because both Joseph and Mary are descended from these regal origins. David the king. The line, it should say, of David, who himself descended from Abraham, who in faith lived as the father of nations and in flesh was the first of the Jewish people. Can a document written so distinctively to Jews be relevant to Singaporeans? the 21st century or any other nation or ethnic group today? 
apart from those who are literal Jews today, who would be the equivalent? People of a certain religion who uh, were being told that the fulfillment of their deepest hopes and longings was to be found in Jesus. Even though uh, required what at least seemed like playing fast and loose with their scriptures in some way. We'll have to look at that. Is Jesus the fulfillment of the deepest longings and hopes of Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and pagans and atheists and everyone else? The virgin birth. Precious doctrine and topic throughout the history of the church. Introduced in chapter 1 verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Those of you who are mothers and fathers, if your daughter came home and told you that story, <laughs> would you believe it? I'm always amazed at how some atheists can say things like, well, they didn't have modern science. And they knew where children came from. This was an as astonishing acclaim in the ancient world as it would be today. A and if we believe it, how is it possible? Chrysostom's homily on Matthew discloses that the early church loved to speculate about that question. And John Chrysostom said, Do not speculate beyond the text. Do not require of it something more than what it simply says. Do not ask, but precisely how was it that the Spirit accomplished this in a virgin? For even when nature is at work, it is impossible fully to explain the manner of the formation of the person. How then, when the Spirit is accomplishing miracles, shall we be able to express their precise causes? What Matthew is interested in here and throughout the first two chapters is that Jesus' birth is fulfilling prophecy. Not about how God managed to pull it off. Jump to the Sermon on the Mount, which begins with the famous Beatitudes. Perhaps none better known than the first. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke's parallel says, Blessed are you, poor using a term that meant the literal, physically impoverished. Do Luke and Matthew contradict each other? I don't think so. The Hebrew anawim, a word found throughout the prophets and the <coughs> Psalms and, and the wisdom literature in general, often referred to those among God's people who were marginalized physically, impoverished, but who turn to God as their only hope. It's a both and. But I don't know what, what happens uh, in this country. I know what happens in uh, the U.S. Nobody knows Luke's Beatitude. They all know Matthew's. And if I ask a group to harmonize those two, they say, well, Matthew explains what Luke means. He's talking about the poor in spirit so that the richest person in the world can qualify. It's not what Jesus was talking about. And we'll get to that one on Saturday. <laughs>
I should have said at the beginning that uh, I have a, a knee which with every passing year is ever closer to being replaced so I ask for these things to sit on so that periodically I sit down and then I stand up again and I go back and forth. So now I'm sitting down. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. How does the Christian apply the Old Testament in the New Testament age? I tread on Philip's territory, so I won't say anything more tonight. <laughs> but that's a perennial question. Leviticus says not to have tattoos. I have seminary students with tattoos who got them as Christians. Are they apostate? <laughs> or did they do some good biblical interpretation? Probably neither. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But what does it mean that Christ has come not to do away with, but neither to preserve unchanged every application of every law? The early Christians wrestled with that question as well. We are promised a new heaven and a new earth, which the Lord God will make. If new ones are to be created, the old ones will therefore pass away. As for what follows, not one iota, not a dot, shall be lost from the law until all is accomplished. Comes right after 5.17 and 5.18. This literally shows that even what is considered least important in the law is full of spiritual sacraments, gifts of grace. And it is all summed up in the gospel. There's a law in that same chapter in Leviticus 19 that I suspect no one in the room is currently obeying. Do not wear clothes made of two different kinds of fabric. <laughs> what gives you the right to throw out God's eternal unchanging word? <laughs> well, you just didn't think about it. <laughs> Or maybe there is a spiritual gift of grace. There is a principle behind that that can be related to abiding New Testament teaching. Saturday. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer. Probably misnamed since he never prayed it. He gave it to his disciples, but it's too late to change the name now. Begins, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Tell an innocuous sounding story. If you want to win people over to a hard message. Uh, a story like... Uh, there once was a rich man who had lots of sheep and a poor man who just had one small ewe lamb and the rich man came and, and stole it, even that lone lamb. And you can tell that story before King David and melt his heart. And then Nathan says, you are the man. And he could have been killed. <laughs> but instead, David repented. Jesus was the master of the parable, even more so than Nathan. And then we come to the classic controversy in the history of Catholic versus Protestant. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Is Peter the rock? Is Christ the rock? 
Is it anybody who confesses Christ like Peter and the rest of the disciples did? The rock? Theodore of Mopsuestia wrote about this rock. This is not the property of Peter alone, but it came about on behalf of every human being. This means he will build his church upon this same confession of faith. For this reason, addressing the one who first confessed him with this title, on account of his confession, he applied to him this authority too, as something that would become his, speaking of the common and special good of the church as pertaining to him alone. It's anybody whose confession is that of Peter when he got it right, Theodore is saying. That's one option. It will be sometime late next week before we get back to that one. And then in the Sermon on Discipleship and Humility and Forgiveness, very popular, reassuring passage to read when the prayer meeting is very poorly attended. <laughs> and we never bother to notice the original context. <laughs> Which is immediately after Jesus' words about church discipline. Do you do church discipline better than most Americans do? Well, most Americans don't even attempt it. And the few that do are often overly harsh. But Jesus' mandate comes here. And then, why two or three? Why not one or two? Is, is God not present if only one person comes to the prayer meeting? Or maybe four or five. I mean, we have to have a critical mass of some kind. No, the two or three is not random. In chapter 18, verse 16, the person who has sinned against us, if they will not listen when we go to them privately, which is, of course, what we always do first before we tell anybody else, Right. If they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Myself plus one or two, this is not higher math, equals two or three. <laughs> and then, within just a couple of verses, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Of course he's there with the two or three who come to the prayer meeting because he's always here. But in context, it's about God promising to bless and to ratify properly carried out church discipline. And then there's that invective against the teachers. And yes, for the sake of time, I've skipped a few quotations, and you can read them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Presumably meaning when they are speaking appropriately of what Moses taught in Moses' seat. But do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. Do you know your pastors well enough to know if they practice what they preach? Do they allow themselves to be seen in the ordinary course of activity? One of the things that disturbs me about the so-called prosperity gospel besides what they do with their money and what they promise people about money is you can never see these people in real life for the most part to see what they're like whether they practice what they preach the parable of the sheep and the goats is that all about uh, helping the poor of the world indiscriminately 
most common interpretation in the 20th and early 21st centuries? Or is it about helping those who bring the gospel and are marginalized? Which was the most common interpretation throughout previous church history. Lots of things we'll have to come back to. And of course, the gospel ends with the very well-known Great Commission. Again, Chrysostom said, Observe the excellence of those who were sent out into the whole world. Others who were called found ways of excusing themselves, but these did not beg off. Jesus reminds his disciples of the consummation of all things. He seeks to draw them further on that they may not look at the present dangers only, but also to the good things to come that last forever. Having invigorated and roused their minds by the remembrance of that coming day, he sent them out. Those who live faithfully with good works should strangely desire that day, even as those who lack good works should fear it. So there is just a selection of some of the themes and texts that the early church found especially meaningful. If we were to sum it all up, the reason that Matthew was the most popular gospel is that it had the greatest cluster of ethical teachings and the church wanted to know how their Lord wanted them to live. Is that what drives the church today? And so, without reneging on my promise to end punctually, to give us plenty of time for conversation, a few thoughts based just on these selected passages about Matthew's relevance today. Jesus is of the right lineage. He is the King. He is the Messiah. He is the liberator of Israel and of all people. And he provides the right kind of liberation that balances concerns for our body and our spirit, for our life in this world and our life in the hereafter. The Gospel is authenticated by fulfilled prophecy. There are approximately 20 Old Testament texts in the Gospel of Matthew that he points to as uniquely fulfilled in Christ and about 10 of those are unique to Matthew's Gospel. It was a major theme along with miracles in the early church to authenticate who Jesus was. <coughs> We should have a unique concern for the poor worldwide and locally. As long as there are still about one billion people below the UN poverty line out of a little over seven billion people in the world. The good news is that in the last 25 years, that number has been cut almost in half, adjusted for inflation. We are making a difference. Christians are making a difference. Sometimes governments are making a difference. Sometimes the business sector is making a difference. Christians and relief work are disproportionately making a difference. We still have a ways to go. We understand the Old Testament only through Christ. That does not mean we find Jesus hidden in every verse of the Old Testament. But we understand what the principles are and we ask how, if at all, has the New Testament brought these to completion, to fruition, to their deepest meaning in the person and work of Jesus. Prayer begins with understanding who God is. One of my earliest memories of a missionary as a little boy was a woman from our Lutheran church in which I was raised whose husband died at a comparatively young age and when she retired from teaching English 
to school children. She joined her sister who had never married, who had been a career missionary in Taiwan. And I remember she was home one time and my parents invited her over and she was trying to explain the difference between preaching the gospel in the US and preaching the gospel in Taiwan and she said here we usually start with John 316 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life but in Taiwan we have to start with Genesis 1 1 because we can't assume common ground on uh, for God. Or what we're talking about with loving the world. Or God's Son. In Denver, for most people, you have to start with Genesis 1-1 in 2016. Because they don't know those things. There's been an amazing loss of biblical literacy in one generation. Even among Christians to say nothing of the unsaved and I'm sure you can relate at least as well here. The golden rule sums up our ethic. Confucius has a lot of good things to say. Sometimes Muhammad has some pretty good things to say. A lot of religions, a lot of wise people have many good things to say. There aren't many parallels in the wisdom of the world to love your enemies. <laughs> Christians do so well with that. <laughs> but that's how we would want to be treated if someone else thought we were their enemies. We all have a lot still to learn. The gospel meets both spiritual and physical needs. We talked about that. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus rescues us from a meritocracy, uh, uh, from a performance-based <laughs> life. <laughs> Sorry. Accidental slip there. <laughs> In eighth grade, 1968, now you can figure out how old I am. I was told by a teacher that uh, the 40-hour work week was on its way out. Some European countries had already gone to 35 and that by the time I was an adult, the biggest challenge for American workers was what to do with their leisure time as we would undoubtedly have a 30-hour work week because we were having all of these inventions and technology that were called labor-saving devices. And now they're labor-creating devices because I can't go anywhere without the obsession to look at my phone. Yep, it's off. Um, <laughs> and this afternoon I graded papers for an online class that I'm supposedly teaching in Denver while I'm... There's no way to get away from it because uh, technology makes it possible for more and more to be demanded from us. And Jesus says at some point, stop and come away and rest. Physically, yes, but but Rest knowing that your worth and your identity is not in how you perform. How liberating could that be if we really imbibed it? <laughs> I'll find out if I believe it, as within a few years I'm looking at retirement. <laughs> is my identity wrapped up in what I do? <laughs> I hope not. Invite me back in a few years and I'll let you know. God's kingdom is best understood by surprising analogies. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. What? If that doesn't strike you as odd, you've really been in church too long. <laughs> 
mustard. The only thing I do with mustard back home is, is get it out of a container and pour it on a hot dog. God's kingdom is like a mustard seed. If the stories aren't fresh and riveting, then we need to create some new ones. The church. Upon this rock I will build my church. I thank God for the parachurch. I thank God for Christian fellowships of every kind. I thank God for every wonderful sermon I can hear online in any language just about. But God's plan was not for Christians to try to do it apart from the local church. Warts and all. Jesus is with us in proper church discipline. Avoid hypocrisy, but don't dwell on it too long. So we'll move on. No, just kidding. <laughs> you can't take it with you. Eventually there's final judgment for all of us. And understand the authority and scope and centrality of our commission. We've come a long way in reaching the world and the last hundred years made more progress than in just about the previous 1900 years. But there's still plenty who have yet to become believers and plenty who have yet to hear. These are uh, thoughts to entice a few of you back and to hopefully encourage all of you to, if you have not read Matthew recently, embark on a good study of it. Embark on a good study of it with a, a wonderful help like uh, Janine Brown's work on Matthew or other resources that are available.